Coming to you on Final Four Weekend. Have been on vacation this past week. Pretty much just been home with the family and, uh, you know, running around with the kids. Also battling a little bit of a cold. So I haven't had a pod since uh, the Zach Martini announcement Wednesday night. Wanted to cover a few things with hoops. Being the Final Four, uh, watching, you know, the NCAA tournament so far and just how I think Rutgers is building its roster for next season and some things to be aware of that just don't necessarily jump off of the stat sheet. Uh, and then also I, I asked, um, you know, on Twitter Friday afternoon, if anyone had any topics or questions they wanted me to kind of cover, not a full scale uh, mailbag or anything like that, but I have a couple of things I wanted to cover, but figured any ideas could, could help add to that and kind of played in perfectly. There's a couple, you know, big 10 expansion questions that I can cover at a later date, but wanted to, a lot of questions about uh, style and roster and all that. So in terms of this team, obviously really good news, adding Tyson Acuff and Zach Martini this week. One thing that stuck out to me that isn't a stat or anything like that, that showed up in coverage of both of them uh, and something that uh, I've touched on throughout the offseason. Also, when I had my spaces two weeks ago on Twitter, or a week ago, whatever that was, uh, and I apologize, I forget who brought it up, but just talking about the importance of mental toughness, right? And this past season, Rutgers didn't have it, and they didn't have the physical toughness or the mental toughness. And it's very apparent in the NCAA tournament that the teams that survive in advance have that toughness. And, you know, whether it's uh, finishing in the top four of the Big Ten, challenging for the Big Ten title, challenging for the Big Ten tournament title, making a deep run into March, whatever – this Rutgers team can be, they're not going to be it unless they have mental toughness to a high degree. And where does that fit in with Acuff and Martini? Well, I think they checked that box in a big way. Um, with Acuff, you know, uh, earlier in the season, there was an article with his father. Uh, and I'm just pulling that up right now in terms of him talking about how he trained him over time. Uh, and this is from the Detroit outlet. Uh, it's his mental toughness, Tyrone said. When he was younger and I was training him, he would start to cry if he got a foul or was losing and wanted to quit. I would make him keep playing. I had to get that out of him early. Now he plays through everything. So I thought that was really interesting because, you know, there's been some concern that, you know, he's coming from a losing team, Eastern Michigan. Um, and I... I think, you know, there's concerns over his efficiency, right? But the reality is his role is going to be completely different at Rutgers. And, you know, he took a lot of contested twos and threes at Eastern Michigan because he was their best player and leading scorer. And that's why he's a top 10 scorer. Not the most efficient because he took, you know, 19 shots a game. He's not going to do that at Rutgers. And I think a lot of the shots that he took that brought down his efficiency aren't going to be shots that Rutgers is going to want him to take. He's going to take more spot-up threes which is going to, I think, benefit him. He shot 39% two years ago in the Atlanta 10 for Duquesne. He shot 35% the year before. But this past year, he had the ball in his hands pretty much the whole time. Uh, but he does three things specifically well that Rutgers desperately needs to be an efficient offense. He scores at the rim two-thirds of the time. He shoots over 80% from the foul line, and he has an extremely low 10% turnover rate for a guy that handled the ball all the time. So those three things make it very clear why Rutgers wanted him. And the mental toughness aspect, you know, there, there's something to be said for being a successful player uh, on a losing team. You have to battle through a ton of mental adversity. Uh, and he did, he's, you know, I mean, to have the season that he did, uh, he did that. So I'm very encouraged by his addition. You know, on paper, is he a perfect fit? No, he's not. Um, will he start? I'm not sure. I think Rutgers would be better if he came off the bench. Um, I think I've said it before, the relationship with Mar uh, Marlon Smoke Williamson brings hope to buy in there. And I think the opportunity, you know, and, and you got to love fifth year seniors that, you know, this is their last chance. And uh, bringing a, a, a guy that's proven scorer, uh, but that does those specific things really well, I think is really encouraging. But his mental toughness, that, that quote from his father really stuck out to me in a positive way. And then with Zach Martini, uh, Jerry Carino and his fantastic article about him, which included his senior thesis being on David Lynch, which I can't wait to ask him about it. Um, but in terms of his mental toughness, physical toughness, uh, this is Jerry Carino in his uh, article on uh, Zach Martini last Wednesday, quote, 
On the court, his toughness is well documented. As a junior, during a preseason practice, he suffered a collapsed lung while taking a charge. He spent five nights in the hospital and six weeks on the sideline. And when he finally returned to game action in the very first minute, he stepped into a driving opponent and took another charge. So you got to love that. That is a tremendous antidote and story that uh, just describes his toughness. Like I said, he, he, he uh, and, and let's not forget, he, at least a few plays got the better of Cliff in that season opener. You know, he, he was a crafty guy. He was, un, he was willing to bang. He was willing to be physical. He also held Danny Wolf, uh, the Yale transfer, who's now, you know, uh, highly sought after seven footer. Again, Martini, six, seven, held him, uh, guarded him in February when Princeton beat Yale at Jadwin, held him to O of eight from the floor. This kid is a gamer. He's a hooper and he's tough as nails. And, Aside from his 38% three-point shooting, his spot-up ability from the three, his ability to stretch the floor, space the floor, pull his defender out, uh, you know, being a top 100 offensive uh, rating in the country this past season, he brings toughness. And Rutgers desperately needs that. So experience, uh, certain efficiencies that pop out, but the toughness part is really encouraging with both these guys. And moving on, just in terms of Dylan Harper, you know, how he, uh, he got co-MVP of the McDonald's All-American game this year, uh, this week, excuse me, if you saw him, he, uh, I, I think it's important to, to, to think about, you know, there's a lot of talk and obviously Kentucky bombing out, you know, freshmen don't win in the postseason anymore with COVID and all that stuff with the extra year and guys being 23, 24. And that's very true. And Rutgers certainly is heeding that warning by adding to fifth year guys in Martini and Acuff. And I, I'm sure they're going to try to add at least one more experienced guy. You also have Jeremiah Williams back to go with this fabulous 24 recruiting class, including Ace Bailey, Nathan Somerville, Bryce Storch, uh, Dylan Grant. But with Dylan, I think it's important to note that, you know, as the floor general, as the point guard, uh, he brings a certain level of experience as a freshman. That is not normal. Uh, his family pedigree, obviously his father, you know, uh, when I was growing up, I mean, watching his father play, uh, was a delight. Uh, you know, I wasn't a Laker or Bulls fan, but I always loved watching his dad play. Cause I, you know, I'm a, I was a shooter and I love shooters and, uh, Ron Harper's just so smooth out there. Five NBA championships. And obviously, uh, his mother is a coach, uh, and, uh, was a great college player in her own right. Uh, and then you have Ron, obviously. Uh, who's, you know, been in the G League the last two years after a very successful, you know, uh, a founding uh, a, a huge uh, part of Rutgers uh, resurging and rising under Peichel. Um So that family pedigree is in him. That experience and, and guidance is there for him. But also just in terms of, I mean, he he's played, his experience at this at this stage of his career is far greater than what his father or brother had. Uh, so, you know, He's been in every. He's been in high profile uh, at all the top events, camps. You know, gone against head to head against all the best players in his class, and and even a class above it. I mean, he played for Team USA at FIBA, nineteen World Cup last year. You know, he's played such a high level of competition for for a couple years now. Uh, not to mention New Jersey basketball and, and Don Bosco. So yes, he's still going to be a freshman. He's still going to have uh, a learning curve. But I think that, you know, and, and what's stuck out with him on film and just, you know, in terms of the All-American game, what Scott's love about him is his his just his court IQ. His, he's a cerebral player. You know, he's very in control. He sees the floor. He makes the right decisions. Uh, he is uh, just, you know, and it's funny because they the, the scouts knock is, you know, he's not the most athletic. And, you know, Ace Bailey is certainly uh, unbelievably athletic. But Dylan Harper can certainly, he knows how to use his body. He's a very smart player and he knows how to create opportunities for himself and his teammates. He's an unselfish player. You know, he's been a, a top five EYBL assist guy. He led Team USA to assist on the at FIBA 19 World Cup. Uh, you know, he uh, is going to be able to play a role too. And that's going to be floor general. He's going to be able to score in multiple ways. But, you know, all this talk, and I wanted to get to a couple of the, the tweets in terms of the questions that I got uh, yesterday uh, that I appreciate everyone who uh, did reach out to me. Um, there was a couple on style, which I wanted to touch on. Um, 
Keith Flyer, do you have any insights, thoughts on whether Rutgers might embrace a shift in scheme personnel to become better offensively? Something like what Alabama does where they pretty much only take threes and shots in the paint. And John Jamgochian, what will Rutgers basketball style of play resemble next year? Two great questions, uh, similar. And uh, really, that is my point in terms of, you know, bringing Martini into space, the floor. Uh, Acuff's another guy that can, you know, create his own shot. But Dylan Harper is going to be the guy with the ball in his hands the majority of the time. And if Rutgers can space the floor and let him create, uh, it's going to be a really positive thing. Obviously, they need to, you know, uh, have a lot of motion, screening actions, things like that. But just having a guy like Harper that's, you know, a size mismatch at 6'6 at point guard, you're going to have other guards that can really handle it with Jeremiah Williams, uh, Acuff as well. And again, remember, they're not done adding to this roster. And I really think that a shooter uh, guard type is a must to continue to add to this team. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, let's not forget J. Mike had J. Michael Davis had a three to one assist to turnover ratio for a good portion of the season. Uh, and then, you know, kind of tried to do too much, I think. And then the offense kind of fell apart overall. And he was just a freshman, but he, he brought some things I thought as well. Um, so, you're going to have a team that, you know, and that's why they need shooters. They need shooters to help uh, keep the defense spread out so you have more space and driving lanes for guys like Harper, Williams, Acuff, and whoever else is going to be on this team, Ace Bailey as well from the wing. Uh, so I think that, yes, that the, the, you can see how Peichel's building the roster. That and, and you know, Pikel's taught. I've mentioned this before. He, he, you know, he loved the way Michigan played with Beeline, and that was that was a five spread. That was guys of all different sizes that could all uh, shoot the three and spread the floor. And uh, you know, Rutgers, I think, is trying to 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 take some of that out out of their that playbook and and incorporate it into next season. Uh, so again, how they build this roster is going to be so key to that. But this team's going to be able to run in a way that they weren't able to run this year. And they're going to be able to finish at the rim in a way they weren't able to finish this year. I think they're going to shoot the three much better. Again, I still think you need a, a shooter. Um, and then just in terms of talking uh, about the roster, um, you know, obviously right now it's still incomplete. You have a uh as, uh, you know, at the five. You have Lethan Somerville up front as well at the wing. I mean, you're, you're kind of jam-packed. You have Ace. You have Martini. You have Dorch Grant. And uh, right now, Oscar, no decision on his part um, in terms of whether he's returning or not. And then at guard, you have Dylan Jeremiah, Tyson Acuff, and J. Mike. So you have two open scholarships right now. It would be a third if Oscar does ultimately leave. And uh, you obviously need a big man. I think you need a rim defender. Obviously, they have offensive skills. That would be a plus. But I think you need, you know, with, with the offensive players you have uh, adding to the roster uh, and the younger players you have, you need – uh, a surefire rim defender. And I think uh, there was another question uh, that was from uh, Mike Yard. It feels like things have been quiet over the last few days on the transfer portal front when it comes to a big man. Do you think that Pykel targets more of a rim protector to fill Cliff's role or someone with more of an offensive profile to complement Dylan and Ace? I do think it's more of a rim defender type. And I think part of why you're not hearing a lot of big men right now is the market value for big men is really high. Think about it. I mean, it, uh, in terms of supply and demand, there's a lot more shooters out there than 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 capable fives that you can start at a high major level. You know, Mario Williams is one from Drexel. He dropped Rutgers out of his top four. You know, I I don't think Rutgers was really pursuing him anymore based on his NIL demands, which reportedly, you know, six hundred thousand could be higher. Who knows? Cliff is demanding more. You know, is is not not demanding, but he's uh, the market is there for him to make even more than that. On the NIL front, and and just for those that haven't heard me in the past, yes, he can make NIL um, as an international student. It's called passive, uh, passive uh, NIL in terms of you know it's not active labor. You can't do active labor as an international student in terms of working events, but your image can be used on billboards, ads, things like that. That's passive, uh, and you could be paid NIL that way. And of course, you know, listen, some of the SAC schools, other schools. I mean, it could be you know. Some of the old-fashioned way, too. Who knows? But his demand is really high. Amari Williams, you know, three-time defensive player of the year. Makes sense that Rutgers was interested. But if he's, you know, uh, going to uh, get that from the open market, then I, I just think it's not even if, whether Rutgers can afford it or not. It doesn't really make sense to spend that much when 
you're trying to build a strong, balanced roster. Um, when you can wait it out, I think, and there'll be plenty of capable big men uh, on the open market. Again, it's just three weeks into the portal season. We're now in a dead period with Final Four weekend. There's a coaches convention out in Phoenix. Happens every year at the Final Four. And then the the you know the active period will reopen next Tuesday, the 10th. Uh, is that the 10th? Yes. No, excuse me, the 9th uh, at noon, where you can start to have recruits visit again and things like that. So, you know, Rutgers, they haven't really been linked to any new names lately. I think that's partly intentional. I know that they're working on a lot. Um, and, you know, they're, I think they're, they're waiting out the big men market right now is my, is my gut. I don't know that for sure, but that's my, from what I'm hearing and kind of just how I interpret the market right now, I think that that's what they're doing. But ultimately, yes, I think that they're going to have to get a rem defender uh, capable uh, that, you know, you can you have so much athleticism on the wings and a guard that you're going to be able to take chances defensively. But you need someone in the back that can protect the rim and be an anchor for your defense. So I think that that's more important. Obviously, a guy that, you know, can can roll off screens and score. Uh, that can, you know, be filthy on the glass. That is really important. Yes, you'd love to have post-up moves, but again, post-up moves aren't the uh, most efficient offense. Going back to the question about threes and layups, yes, I would love to see Rutgers do more of that. That's what Alabama, that's pretty much all they exclusively do. They're in the Final Four. Indiana State went to the NIT Championship, lost to Seton Hall. That's pretty much all they do with Josh Schertz's offense. Threes and layups. And you got to make them, right? But that's what those teams focus on. So I think by creating space, right, you're going to have your, your guys that can attack can get to the rim more effectively with more space, of course, right? And then you're also going to have shooters get open in space when those guys drive, you know? And it's going to complement each other in terms of you need guys that can hit threes, you need guys that can get to the rim and finish. Uh, and obviously free throw, you know, adding Martini and Acuff, two guys that can shoot over 80% is huge. And, uh, you know, Dylan Harper is pretty good from the free throw line. I'm honestly not sure about Ace Bailey. Uh, but, you know, he's been lighting it up, uh, you know, the, uh, in events and everything. I mean, he, he had a 40-foot three in warm-ups of the All-American game. I mean, he's got a stroke. So, you know, what can Dylan and Ace bring them from three? Well, remains to be seen. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, their, their talent level and their their scout, I mean, they're, they're super they, – they can, you know, be very proficient from three. Uh, so if they can – I mean, Rutgers didn't have one player over 35% this past year. And you have Martini, who did it last year. You have Acuff who's done it twice in his career. Uh, you have Dylan and Ace coming. Uh, you have, you know, Jeremiah Williams is not a, a particularly strong three-point shooter. Either is Davis. Um, but, you know, we'll see what the other guys can add. Uh, but that's why I think you need another shooter. I think your next ad, if you have two spots left, you got to get a shooter and you got to get a big man. And if Oscar leaves, you could ultimately do anything you want. I think it's maybe best player available at that point. But again, it's it's still early April. Rutgers is far ahead of the game. Uh, they have two guys locked and loaded on the roster for next season now. You have two open spots of now. They had six guys leave. But I think that the staff's done a really good job of preparing. I just want to check my notes here in terms of uh, just everything I wanted to cover in this episode. is pretty much it. I did want to say, just in terms of the Pac-12, I got a question about that. It's crazy to think that with the Pac-12 coming in, 18 teams – Pico will be the seventh most tenured coach in the Big Ten. But, I mean, Pico is really in the top third of most tenured coaches at this point. And it's uh, it's pretty wild. So entering his ninth season, obviously expectations higher than ever. And I just think in terms of the mental toughness, in terms of the ball experience that Harper brings, uh, in terms of the way that you could see they're changing uh, their approach offensively, in terms of, you know, and the whole idea that, you know, Pico doesn't buy into analytics and all that. I mean, just look at, the ads of Acuff and Martini in terms of analytically what their strengths are and what Rutgers desperately needs. So, um, you know, it all makes sense. I think that they have a plan. Uh, obviously, you're going to have a ton of, you know, targets. Some we hear about, some you don't. Uh, the Matalaco thing, you know, it's not looking particularly optimistic at the moment. But I almost wonder if that's, you know, that's been so public. Uh, I, I just wonder if that's a smokescreen for somebody else. Uh, you know, like I said, Martini was very public as well. Uh, Acuff was not. So uh, Rutgers has done this before. Look at Cam Spencer. Look at Jacob Young. I mean, those guys showed up on campus, had an official visit, and boom, committed. So they're working the angles. Uh, and uh, I, I just think that, you know, uh, it's for me, they have to add another shooter. I think that that would be big. And if it's whether it's a wing or a guard, uh, you know, a guy that can handle the ball, 
I think having a, a team out there, uh, uh, guys on the court that can do multiple things, that can all handle the ball, all shoot, it's just going to make this team so much harder to defend and make them so much more efficient offensively. And that's where you need to be. You see in the NCAA tournament, teams got to, you got to score 80 points in the NCAA tournament. You have to defend mental toughness, fundamentals, right? Mental breakdowns. Uh, the UConn women's game last night, everyone's harping on the screen uh, that was called. But what about the, the, the miss box out on the miss free throw from Caitlin Clark with four seconds to go? If UConn gets that. They're down two with four seconds to go. You can get a shot to win the game there. So if you remember back to Rutgers two NCAA tournaments, it was by, it was it was rebounding and boxing out that cost him against Houston and against Notre Dame. Multiple things can cost you a game, but those two things that 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 aspect of the game at the end hurt them with the game on the line, Houston and Notre Dame. So it's all about fundamentals. So for this team, right, just building everything and they need rebounding badly, but it's that mental toughness that's going to get you to stay strong and fundamentally sound when the game's on the line. And I'm just so excited about this team and this program and where they're headed. I hope you are too. And thanks so much for listening and watching once again here at the Scarlet Faithful. Have a great weekend. 